when only one is allowed. Trying to figure out how to unlock it. Sorry. Um, at the bottom, there's like a little symbol with a lock on it and it toggles back and forth. I don't know if you saw that. I think it was in the red side when you stopped sharing. Let y'all know we are having a couple of people still walking into the Multicultural Resource Center. So maybe we'll start at 6.05 if that's okay. So Maya, do you, this is the screen that has the lock on it. Do you wanna give me any guidance on this? What do you think? Hmm. So when you were in the actual question, um, the actual question itself, it had something on the bottom. Mm. Are you able to like start the survey or is this the screen that starts the survey? This is the screen that starts it, but I think it's collecting it. It's just not showing it because it's locked. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stop it and I'm going to restart it. And hopefully that does oh. it <laughs> while people are coming in the room. All right, let's see. Uh, let's duplicate it. Let's cancel this. Oh, this that's not going to work because it's not in the slide set. All right, never mind. Too complicated. <laughs> we'll do it at the end. Probably should have come in the room a few minutes earlier. Okay. Already, is everyone ready? Perfect. All righty. So I don't know if everyone could see us, uh, but hello, my name is Tyler Wolfgang, they, them, and I work in the Office of Multicultural Affairs as a Gender and Sexuality uh, Program Advisor. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Ray Casco. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the Safe and, School, Safe, Safe and Healthy Schools Coordinator at Wyoming Equality. And uh, we are broadcasting here from the Multicultural Resource Center. So we have some folks in the room. Just to let you know, I do have my camera on. If you don't want to sit directly behind me, you can, uh, I can uh, take my camera off. Just let us know. But um, I'm going to go, uh, since we are broadcasting from the Multicultural Resource Center, I'm going to read uh, a land acknowledgement real quick from our ACW student government. So we collectively acknowledge that the University of Wyoming, Wyoming occupies the ancestral and traditional lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Crow, Shoshone indigenous peoples, along with other native tribes who called the Great Basin and Rocky Mountain region home. 
We recognize, support, and advocate alongside indigenous individuals and communities who live here now and, those, uh, and with those forcibly removed from their homeland. And then uh, we are uh, here uh, uh, with our grad assistant, Maya, uh, who will be monitoring the chat. Uh, Maya, I'm gonna go over, <laughs> Maya just waved. Um, I'm gonna go over the, uh, that we hope uh, in the chat that you can create a respectful atmosphere. Um, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and hopefully we'll get to it at the end or with, uh, sometime when uh, Diane opens up the Q&A section. Um, but just so everyone knows, uh, we just wanna make sure everyone, uh, if you do uh, uh, put a question in the chat, make sure that uh, you, um, there's no uh, specific phobia, so no transphobia, aphobia, biphobia, lesphobia, or homophobia. Uh, if you're referring to someone, please respect one's gender identity and pronouns. If you do mess up in the chat, uh, hopefully we're not doing a whole comment section, uh, but apologize when messing up and move forward. Uh, then just no we do have a no tolerance for trans exclusionary thoughts. Uh, trans women are women, trans men are men. Uh, please respect that. Uh, no, uh, don't make any assumptions on one's gender identity or any identity in general. Uh, and then uh, make a conscious effort to improve your vocabulary and remove gender, racist, or ableist language. Um, and then if you, uh, please make sure you ask for consent uh, if you are gonna reference someone outside of here. So if you meet someone within the room, or you meet uh, with someone within the chat or whatnot, make sure that you have uh, permission to reference them outside of uh, this specific event. Uh, we just wanna protect confidentiality. And that's about it I have for now. Maya, do you have anything else you would like to say? I do not, you covered that beautifully, thank you. Perfect. I'll let Ray introduce our speaker. All right, so thank you everybody for coming both online and in person. Um, as I said, I'm Ray. Um, this is our first event for our gender affirming series. This has been a year in kind of um, in the works. Um, we created this program to um, make gender affirming series resources more accessible because we live in a state that doesn't have that many resources. But the ones we do, we want to make sure that everybody knows about them. And so. We're here to talk about HRT with the amazing Diane. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna put what's your last name. Is it Brousseau? Yes, Diane Brousseau. And like, I could go, I was trying to create her um, bio by myself and I was looking at her email signature and I'm just like, oh my God, there's so many titles. <laughs> um, but Diane divides her time between medicine. She's the director of justice, equity, diversity and inclusion and an assistant professor adjunct at the Yale School of Medicine PA online program where she teaches the next generation of medical professions about sexual and gender minority health. Her medical practice, Healthy Transitions, is dedicated to the care of transgender and non-binary non patients across the lifespan. So take it away, Diane. All right, thank you, Ray and Maya and Wolfgang for that awesome introduction. I'm so delighted to be here and uh, chatting with all y'all. Um, let's see if I can I'm gonna try to get a little technical thing going here to see if this works for us. Here we go. All right, is it going? Okay. Um, and if you give me just 30 seconds, I, I'm about a half a step behind on my um, having this uh, having my notes ready. So just bear with me two seconds. Let's see if I can pull this off. Oh, come on, let's see. I'm, I'm using my <laughs> iPad for my notes and it's just not cooperating, one second. Um, I wanna leave the slide up for a second so that you guys have my contact information for a couple of reasons. One is if there's something you think about after we leave the room, I would be delighted to hear from you, whether it's on uh, Twitter or Instagram or Clubhouse or LinkedIn, wherever you feel most comfortable, go ahead to DM me, say you were in the room and that's you know totally fine with me uh, to hear from you later, later on as well. And by later on, I mean, it could be, you know, tomorrow, it could be a year from now, whenever it is. Um, I do want to give a little plug. So I know there's a bunch of folks in the room who are undergrads. And, um, you know, I'm a I'm a PA. And uh, 
many folks don't quite know what a PA is or what a PA does. So I just want to give you that kind of background for a moment, which is that, you know, if you're if you're someone that's you know seeking trans health, there's four different <laughs> Thank you. Uh, four different professions that are prescribers, right? There's, there's everybody knows an MD, right? There's also DOs, which are doctors of osteopathy, right? Uh, there's uh, NPs or nurse practitioners, and then there's PAs. Now, uh, in all in all fifty states, Wyoming, New York, where I am, um, you know, we're we're all prescribers, which means that when you're looking for someone potentially for your care for your trans health, and you're looking through a list of doctors of MDs you may be uh, ignoring or missing uh, other providers who are able to prescribe, who are licensed and able to prescribe, and that would be delighted to help you. So um, just wanna make sure you understand that, you know, PAs are out there in Wyoming, and you know, I'm, I'm licensed in Wyoming as well, but there's many others, as well as nurse practitioners, MDs and DOs that are all uh, delighted to be helpful. Um, I also wanna share with you that, you know, even at a place like Yale, they're really into making sure our students get to know about trans health and what we call sexual and gender minority health for the whole LGBT community. Um, one of the things that I do in my job there is I, I teach med students and PA students. Um, we, we break out into small groups um, three days a week, two hours each time. Uh, and we work through cases, we work through trans health cases. I mean, this is amazing, right? Um, and I, I wanted to share that with you because I wanted you to know the, you know, the world's changing, right, in a, in a lot of really great ways in medicine and in nursing. And folks are, uh, at least in healthcare, are really moving the needle very much forward. Uh, and in my experience, most folks, that I, students that I come across and, and new grads and future PAs and future doctors, um, they want to do the right thing. They may not always just know what it is. Um, I also practice clinically. I've been doing trans health since um, 2001, when someone I, I really care deeply about transitioned, and I realized my education was inadequate, uh, that I didn't have what I needed. Um, and I was also really embarrassed by how they were treated. So I um, started to read the literature on trans health. And back then, there wasn't very much. I would maybe get um, maybe four things published a month. And I want to tell you now that there's days when I see 14 things were published or 40 things. And last uh, within the last year, there was one day that there was 140 articles. So not only are is the healthcare profession moving forward on this, but even the research and the data is uh, also coming along. Um, I serve on the editorial board of a transgender health journal. It's a global journal. It's uh, where all the, many, much of the data comes through. And I can just tell you, it's super inspiring to see it. I wanna make sure that you that you know that there's, that there's progress being made. Okay, let's try something new. I have no idea if this will work, but let's give it a shot. I wanna understand what makes you interested in being here today. Is this for your own journey? Are you a student? Are you a parent? Are you a, um, teacher who are you and why is this important to you and you know you might be more than one role so go ahead and enter more than one more than one word and let me get this out of the way so you can see how to do this so you can either do this on your phone you can do this on your computer whichever you prefer and oh it won't show up attached to your name it'll be totally anonymous i won't even see your ip address but we'll get a chance to a couple of word clouds and this will help me see who's who's here and what inspires you there we go yep so we got a lot of trans folks in the room some folks into physiology some folks with some needs some folks with some majors in I'm gonna guess uh, it's helpful if you put things together as one word, like even if it's a run on word or like you put a little hyphen, <laughs> that'd be great. Um, I see social work, I see care, I see uh, giving back, ally, um, trans student, family members, people into either you're a pharmacist or, or studying pharmacy or you're curious about the meds <laughs> trans and exploring thank you for doing that putting it all together in one word pharmacy school student thank you for doing it in one word curiosity friends clients yeah parents loved i love that love is in there that's awesome yeah but the biggest words are trans and family I am student and support. I love everything about that. Okay, 
I'm going to go on to the next screen if I can figure that out. Let's see if I can make it work. <laughs> ah, okay, a couple things, really quick disclosures. Um, this is not a provider patient relationship. This is me talking to a group of folks and and uh, does not mean that we have a provider patient uh, relationship is not medical advice. If you're trans yourself or someone you care about is trans, that first bullet re uh, is re relevant, <laughs> relevant to you. Sorry, it's like eight o'clock here. I was up since like four. Um, the other three bullets are for medical providers or healthcare providers in the room that are relevant uh, to you. Okay. So greetings, I live in Queens, New York. It is the most uh, diverse place on the entire planet. If you wanna get granular, there's over 800 languages that are spoken here. Um, and uh, we have we hold the Guinness World Record for like the, the capital of linguistic uh, diversity for the entire globe. Uh, so for this reason and many other reasons, language is extremely important to me. So I'm just gonna do a drive-by on some terms, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, because really what we see in social media is not necessarily what we see, what we look at from a science perspective um, and in an evidence-based perspective. The other thing is that the definitions that I'm going to share may not necessarily match up what, how you personally define yourself, and there's going to potentially be a disconnect. So I want to just call that out. I acknowledge that. Um, you know, the researchers, health researchers are working on figuring out how to best um, uh, study what the needs of the community are and there's and so there's going to be it's not necessarily the same needs that the individual member might have okay assigned sex of birth kind of speaks for itself gender identity and gender expression this is this is 2101 for you guys but i want to point out something about this um there's some really cool data now that looks at um folks whose gender identity is aligned with their assigned sex of birth but their gender expression may not be um, and when you separate out folks whose who's gender identity and assigned sex are at some point in their life um, different um, uh, from folks who, for, for whom their, their experience is all in the gender uh, expression category, it really breaks down um, the trans community in a way that helps medical providers to see really who's accessing care and who may not be. And this, I'm, you know, I just realized, I'm, let me take it down like 10 more, 10 more notches. This is, in looking at the difference between gender identity and gender expression, is where um, folks like me get to answer the question. Um, you might have seen in the media when folks say things like, well, you know, look at some folks that maybe retransition or detransition, what's going on? You know, there's, we shouldn't give anybody access to care. The, the answer, the solution to that is actually in understanding the difference between identity and expression. And I'll leave it at that. Trans and cis. Um, some folks are non-binary, right? Which you may consider part of trans or not. Um, and with with the definition I'm using is just anyone for trans, anyone whose identity or expression is something other than what was assigned at birth. So really big, broad umbrella. Um, I like to do something called a priming exercise at the beginning of every time I do a talk. And uh, the intent of it is to try and um, remove some of the bias in the room. And uh, so I'm going to introduce you to three amazing people, um, and I want you to keep them in mind um, as I as I go through the rest of the content I'm going to share with you. The first person on the screen is Dr. Alan Hart. He's a Yale graduate many, many years ago. Go Bulldogs. Uh, he's a doctor, and um, he's the guy that discovered how to diagnose tuberculosis when someone has TB in their lungs, how to use an x-ray to diagnose it. That's that's the magic that he brought to the game. He was assigned female at birth, and uh, unfortunately, as he was in, when he was alive, uh, testosterone supplements uh, did not exist. Right? Uh, it wasn't until much, much later. Um, I think it was the 1940s or 50s when when that became available. The person in the middle, Link, Link Conway. If you like your cell phone you have this trans woman to thank for it. She's uh, in part responsible for the silicone chip. So she's pretty amazing for that reason. And, uh, and the last person on the right, yes, I, I, I know it's a trigger to see the, the, the heading that, that they put with this uh, New York uh, Magazine cover, but uh, Martine Rothblatt is amazing. If you like your satellite radio, Martine Rothblatt's the person who invented that. Um, so again, another amazing trans person I want you guys to, to, to keep in the back of your mind. 
and uh, just to be crystal clear that we're all on the same page, I'm approaching this from the perspective that gender diversity is common. Uh, it's culturally diverse. It exists across all cultures. It's not any different in terms of a normal variation than it is to be left handed or to be gay or to be in some other minority position. It is not inherently pathological negative. It's just a variation. And this is something that's agreed upon not only by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, but also the American uh, Psychiatric and Psychological Associations. All right, a couple of quick numbers, because uh, I'm a numbers person. So I want to share with you general numbers from the US as far as how many percentage and how many folks in the US are trans. Um, and I want to give you some highlights. So generally speaking, we're looking at 1.4 million adults. Um, if you look in that middle column, you see that 3.14% that's highlighted in the 18 to 24 year olds. That's because uh, DC, Washington DC, has the greatest percentage of transgender folks in that age range, 18 to 24. And if you look all the way to the right, over 65 years old, you'll see 0.29 is highlighted. That's actually the lowest percentage anywhere. And that's in North Dakota. And at the very bottom, you should, let me get this out of the way here, hold on. If you get the very bottom, you should be able to see the numbers for Wyoming, just to give you context. So we'll look between 13 and the oldest trans person there is in Wyoming, we're looking at about 2,100 folks. Um, you know, you can see where your percentages lie. For 13, 17 year olds, you're not quite as low as North Dakota. Um, for uh, elders, for our seniors, um, you are in the same range as uh, North Dakota. Um, and you've got a few more folks uh, in that 25 to 64 year old range. Okay. There was this amazing study that was done um, in 2016, it was published. It had an N of over 27,000 uh, transgender folks uh, who are 18 and up across all states, all territories, the Marshall Islands, all of these, every place was amazing. And the, the fact that there was 27, over 27,000 trans adults that participated is incredible when you consider there's 1.4 million you know, folks in the US. So that's about 20% of the folks that participated. And I want to highlight that 31% of the respondents to the survey identified as non-binary. So we really do, we're really seeing about a third of the folks identifying as trans mask, a third identifying as trans femme, and then the other third in the non-binary realm. And the, and the numbers are starting to move on that as we're getting other data as well. It's starting to look more, the, the data that just came out looks like 39% trans femme, 36% trans mask, and then there's a, a bigger, a deeper dive going into the, the remaining percentage. All right, so when it comes to all the things that are available to help support folks in their transition, whether it's pubertal suppression or hormones or, or uh, procedures, whether it's a social transition, legal transition, or any of the things that folks will do to help support themselves, whether it's binding or gaffing or vocal coaching or anything along those lines, uh, there is a crystal clear statement uh, from the World Professional Association for Transgender Health that says that these are not optional. These are medically necessary things. There is no question, you know, hard stop. Um, and I want to share with you also this list and I want you to look at the dates. So these are all medical uh, professional associations um, across the US uh, well, and, the, and the World Health Organization. They're all in agreement with that statement from WPATH that these are not optional procedures. These are not, this is not optional care. This is medically necessary care. And I want you to look at the dates. See how some of those are 2007, 2008. This is, this is not new. This is stuff that the medicine understands and the research has shown this is, this is really important for, for people's lives. With that in mind, here's, let's, let's see, how do I do this? So you can see the full screen. Give me one sec. I'm working off like a 14 inch uh, <laughs> laptop here. I'm going to see if I can make my um, uh, hide my video panel, hide my meeting controls. Okay, that should be better. Um, so today I'm going to focus mostly on the two things in that red circle there, the puberty, uh, deferring puberty and hormone therapy. But there's still so many other things that are um, available. Uh, and this is kind of to me like sort of like the universe of the what's available. When it comes to um, deferring puberty, uh, a couple of things are important for you to see here. One is that under the reversibility column, you see where it says completely reversible? It is completely reversible. And I'll talk to you about how that works 
in a minute. Um, there's nothing about um, uh, putting a hold on puberty that will interfere with it. Once the medication is taken away, the, the puberty can happen. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting about it is it's different than almost anything else like you know, hormones or procedures where you, know, you have to be a certain age or you have to, uh, in, in this case, when it comes to um, when to start a, a pubertal suppression medication, um, it has to do with what they call stage, not age. So we refer to uh, that as developmental stage, right? So different folks have, uh, our bodies uh, go, start to go through puberty at different times, right? For some folks, it might be 10, for some folks, it might be 12, for some folks, it's super early, for other folks, it's super late. Um, but the timing of when this medication is used is there's no, there's no age restriction, like there's no younger age restriction, there's, there is one requirement, and that is that puberty had to have started. And for someone that's assigned female at birth, that means that you have, that, that person would have to have the beginning of um, breast budding. If it's someone who's assigned male at birth, that means that their genitals, the size of their genitals started to change. Um, the, it doesn't mean that there's hair growth, there's actually a different pathway that's responsible for that. Um, it is, it is, specific to those two things because those two things are specific to uh, a body producing estrogen or producing testosterone and i just want to say i put my apologize in advance i know some of the times using the terms that are the anatomical terms can be triggering for folks um so i just want to acknowledge that um just from the start uh so we're looking at stage not age we're looking at something that's completely reversible does it have to go through a medical professional yes it does um let me talk a little bit about what happens. I am hoping that there's somebody in the room who wants to become a nursing professional and wants to become a medical professional. <laughs> and the next 30 seconds are for you, right? So here's how these medications work. Um, when someone's ready, body's ready to go through puberty, their brain sends a pulsing message. It releases um, a chemical in a pulsing way. And it and the the genitals, the whether it's the testes or ovaries, they they only hear that pulsing. Uh, they, 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 they capture that pulsing. And when they, when they experience that pulsing release of those chemicals, then they start to develop, then they start to produce estrogen and produce testosterone, right? So it's, it's the communication between the brain and the ovaries and the testes that, that is what's, hap what's making um, puberty happen. What this medication does is it just turns off the faucet in the brain, turns off the release um, of the of that pulsation actually what it does is it forces the brain to sort of consistently release it so you don't get the pulse anymore and that's actually what's what stops it so it it uh doesn't do anything to a person's genitals it, it works up at the level of the pituitary and the hypothalamus in the brain um when the medication runs out if, if someone misses a dose or they're late for the next dose um the, the brain turns back on, right? So all you have to do is stop the medication and puberty will continue. And that's what we mean by this is completely reversible. This is, it's just a pause. It's like hitting a space bar. It, it doesn't do any damage to the, to the genitals. It doesn't do any damage to the brain. It just, it just changes that one tiny, tiny thing. Um, okay. These medications come in a couple of different formats. I will tell you that nobody likes any of them. There's injections that can be daily. There's injections that can be monthly, and the dose that we give is depending on, on the weight, the person's weight. Um, there's also an injection that happens every three months. What I like to give for my patients is a tiny little pellet that gets implanted kind of right over here. Um, you get a little, the patient gets a little bit of um, numbing medication, uh, and it's sort of, it's sort of slipped in under the skin, and uh, it can be replaced every 12 months, but it can, these can continue to work up to 36 months. The problem is sometimes when you get to like two years, they're harder to remove and replace. Um, but you have to find a provider that knows how to switch them out. But those are the sort of formulations. That's the sort of the way. There's, it's not a pill. It's not a patch. It's not a cream. You have to be consistent. Um, if you're taking the monthly um, and it turns out that the, the dose isn't quite right, um, we can't change the dose, but what we can do is shorten the interval. So maybe that person comes in every 26 days instead of every 28 days. So these are kind of like the little nuances around um, uh, deferring puberty that will be helpful for, for folks uh, with interest in this to know about. Okay. Uh, stand by. All right.
Oops, too far. So what are some of the things that we don't want to see happen that can happen with pubertal suppression? And let me just say that I'm going to go through effects, side effects and things that can, um, like if you read the side of an aspirin bottle, you know, you probably won't take, <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to take aspirin anymore. And that's kind of like the extent of like what I'm discussing here. There are things that have only happened in a very, very small, less than 1% of people, um, but I'm still going to report them to you. Let's talk about the most common stuff first. When um, someone goes on a puberty blocker, there's a thing that happens called a puberty flare. Uh, it's, it's reversible. It happens about two to four weeks after the medication is delivered. And um, what it means is that puberty gets worse before it gets better. But I always tell patients, you know, don't worry because it will get a little worse and then it will back, it'll back off, right? So if a person is just in the very beginning stages of puberty, it will go back to no puberty. If they're a little further along, it'll just go back a stage. Um, but it's really important, not all, not all prescribers will tell their patients, hey, you're going to have a really tough two weeks before things get better. Um, and that can be really, um, you know, unpleasant for the person, for the kid who's going through it, the adolescent who's going through it. Um, it does make folks more sensitive to sunburns, so you've got to wear sunscreen, you know, long sleeves, things like that. And some people have reactions to the injection reaction to the medication that does happen sometimes as well. There are some less common things that can happen, again, allergy. Um, so some of the things on the left side there, super, super rare, like so rare that there's what we call case reports where it happens in one person and there's a report about it because it's so unusual. Um, but part of doing what's called informed consent means that we're sharing with you the whole range of, of what can potentially happen. Okay. Uh, can I make this change screens? Let's see. Here we go. I'm, I'm sharing this with you. <coughs> it's the... It's the um, front page of a journal article uh, to remind me to tell to tell you two things. Um, so this was written by two um, two physicians. They're not endocrinologists. They are pediatricians. They're primary care providers, adolescent medicine docs, and basically what they're saying back as far as 2014 is that pubertal suppression is a primary care thing to do. Right? It's you don't need to go off to a specialist. Um, in many gender centers around the country, whether it's Chicago where Rob Gar Dr. Garofalo works or Los Angeles where uh, Dr. Olson works uh, or many of the other places where I've been involved, um, it's run by primary care providers. It's run by PAs and NPs. It's really unusual to see a, an endocrinologist in the room. Um, and this has been the case since long before 2014 when this was published. So I wanna also put that out to you because it may be that your nearest, um, your family's nearest provider uh, is a pediatrician, is an adolescent medicine doc, right? It's not necessarily uh, an endocrinologist that you have to drive very, go very far to see. Um, and the Endocrine Society guidelines, they agree with this. The World Professional Association for Transgender Health, UCSF's guidelines, they, this, there's agreement um, from this perspective across many different um, expert groups. All right, let's get into hormone therapy. So a couple things you're gonna notice on this on this screen. You do have to see a medical provider or a nursing provider, someone who's a prescriber to be able to, to get access to this medication. If you look under reversibility, it says partially reversible, right? And that's why it gets a little more intense because there's things that can happen. There's physical changes that can happen that um, if we stop the hormones, it doesn't make them go away. So if someone goes on testosterone, for example, that that deepening of their voice, even if they stop the T, the, the, the facial and body hair, those things won't go away. I mean, the facial hair, you could theoretically go get electrolysis, but um, the, the voice will never change back. The same thing with someone who's going on feminizing hormones. To be on estrogen, your, their breast development won't go away unless there's, you know, there needs to be a surgical uh, correction. So it's not, it's not reversible the same way that pubertal uh, blockers are. Um, anyone 18 up? can have access to this with informed consent, obviously uh, has to meet some criteria uh, as being appropriate for them. And there's, there's greater um, understanding now for uh, appropriateness of hormone therapy in adolescence. Oops, I went too fast, <laughs> sorry. Um, and just, I wanna have two quick comments on adolescence as appropriate. In some folks for whom they've, they've um, you know, uh, been communicating about their gender since, you know, before they were verbal, when they were very, very young. Uh, often it's um, uh, the recommendations from the mental health professionals is that it's best to go through puberty uh, uh, in tandem at the same time 
as someone's peers because it's really hard as you can imagine um, to go through college and go through your second puberty at the same time right so if it's possible to identify folks uh, who can benefit from this care at a their youngest possible age we can help uh, support their development by ensuring that there's access to hormones now i've heard that there's rumors some folks say you can't access hormones until you're 18 well you know maybe that's the case in your family or in your um in your uh uh, among the adults that are supporting you, but from a medical perspective, that number doesn't doesn't exist in any document, right? There may be like a, a, a medical practice that says we don't treat people under eighteen. That's just their uh, their comfort zone of where they're they're comfortable treating. Um, but in in terms of like the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, where our standards of care come from, uh, that's that number doesn't ex exist. It used to be 16 and it was a random number that was chosen because 16 is the age of consent in Europe. Remember, these are global, these are global guidelines. Um, there seems to be a little bit more movement now. Um, the new guidelines that just came out two weeks ago, they don't say a number, they don't say, you know, 14 or 12 or something like that. They just say when it's when it's developmentally appropriate. And that leaves it up to the providers and the family and the patient to to work through and figure out when is a sweet spot for that. So I want to be really clear that um, that there's a lot more opportunity there to be patient centered. The reason I share these two um, uh, magazine covers is, um, you know, here's an example of, you know, someone who's feminized and someone who's masculinized, um, Aidan Dowling and Laverne Cox. And I want to also say that not everyone who seeks uh, hormone care or transition related care is seeking this extent of masculinization or feminization and you know, prescribers know that, you know, we have to be patient centered, right? And to um, help our patients find what that sweet spot is for them. And for some, for some folks who are, um, this is just a reminder also that there's some non-binary folks also that are accessing masculinizing and uh, feminizing care, but are not looking for that extent, oops, sorry, for that extent of feminization or masculinization. Um, this just reinforces what I was just saying, this is my reminder to say to you that, um, you know, if you're if you're transitioning and you go online to your Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or wherever you're going these days, <laughs> Facebook groups, um, and you see that someone else is on a different dose of uh, hormones than you are, um, you know, it doesn't mean that that's also going to be the right dose for you, right? It means that might be the right dose for them. Uh, the, the dosing and the frequency is all, it's all determined based on a whole lot of things. It's not a cookbook. It's not like, you know, like diabetes and hypertension, you know, I will treat somebody's hypertension until their blood pressure comes down to a specific number. There is no number that treats folks who are trans, right? It's where's the sweet spot where you're like, yeah, this is me. I feel really good. Um, and for some folks that takes more than others and some folks it doesn't take as much. Um, when I was in Amsterdam a couple of years ago, 2016, I think it was for the uh, WPATH meeting, um, there was a panel of trans folks and every one of them agreed. They said that um, in each case, they, whether they were masculinizing or feminizing, they had an idea of where they wanted to be. But as they started going along their journey, what they, every one of them said is they realized that they sort of, they got to a place where they said, oh, you know what, I felt better where I was three months ago or six months ago, like the pendulum sort of swung almost too far and they backed off a little bit. So um, providers who've been doing this for a while, we know that, you know, where you, where you start, what your goal is when you start may adjust, may shift as you're going through your journey. And it's super common and super normal for folks to say, mm, I thought I wanted to be there, but now I realize I want to go two steps back. Um, so I just want to, bring that up as well. So all right, so let's get into the hormones themselves. So this is a fancy way to say, <coughs> uh, and the left side is the, the feminizing meds and the right side is uh, masculinizing meds. Feminizing meds can be taken in a pill, but only for folks who are under 45 years old. You get to 45 and we change you to one of the other formulations and that's just for a safety reason. Um, it does also come in a patch. Those patches get changed once a week or twice a week. And it also comes and an injection. What it doesn't come in is a um, like a topical, like a cream, the same way that the testosterone does. Some folks feminize just with estrogen. Other folks need a medication that's going to help to push the. Excuse me, one second. I have a cough. One sec.
pardon me. Um, some folks use them, some folks don't need them. There's a whole bunch range of things that we can use for that purpose. I'm not going to get into them in this conversation. Excuse me one sec. Thank you. When it comes to tea, there's no oral uh, medication in the US. There is, I don't know anyone who's using it yet. It's, it has a different safety profile. <coughs> I'm so sorry. I'm just getting over cold here. So that does it. <laughs> um, so even though there's an oral medication that was just released in the last year, I don't know anyone who's using it yet. I would say it's sort of like leave that alone for now. Injections can be anywhere from every week to even every four weeks, but that's not the like the regular testosterone. There's a testosterone called a, a depot testosterone, a depot testosterone, which makes it have like a longer life inside of you, sort of makes it last longer. Most folks are every one to two weeks, but some of the depot shots can be every four weeks. There's a cream or a gel you can put on every day. And it also um, comes in a patch. It's also daily. Now, who can't who can't have access to this? Here's some fancy words on here, and I'm sorry about that. Um, oh, and I also want to call out. I'm trying to use a couple of images that are sort of like iconic trans images. So this is a um, icon, absolutely iconic uh, self portrait um, from a, a photographer, and you can see in his right hand he's injecting his testosterone, and his left hand he's taking the photo um, and uh, uh, just a very powerful image. I wanted to share some of the, the iconic iconography, I guess, uh, with all of y'all. So for folks who are on her feminizing, there's there's three folks for whom estrogen is absolutely contraindicated. And this this happens super rarely. Um, and in these cases, you know what? I, I still want to see these patients because there's a, a million other things we can still do with anti-androgens, with surgeries, with other, other things. It, thromboembolism is a fancy word to say a blood clot. This is mostly older folks. If somebody's on a blood thinner and they get a blood clot anyway, uh, that makes them ineligible for estrogen. The risks are just too great. Uh, the other two things are like um, a blood clot that's happening with an infection uh, while they're on sort of this blood thinner. And the third one is any kind of cancer that will grow if the body has estrogen in it, right? And these are super rare, but they exist. Um, there's a little asterisk next to pregnancy when it comes to testosterone, um, because on the one hand, we have data that shows that um, if a developing fetus is exposed to testosterone, there is a risk for some um, for some changes to happen, some, some un, 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 unwanted changes to happen in that, uh, in that fetus. However, the flip side of that is I have plenty of trans mask patients who are sexually active with cis male or, or other folks who have the have the plumbing that can allow them to be, you know, to be to become pregnant, uh, who have found themselves to be the parents of happy, healthy babies. So I feel like the fertility and the pregnancy issue is something we still need to sort out from a medical perspective. Um, but for now, the recommendation that's given is if you want to be, a, uh, if you want to gestate, if you want to be a parent and you're on T, we ask that you come off it for six months um, just to minimize that risk. This is what I usually talk about when I do informed consent with a patient, all the various um, risks that are associated with the different meds. And, you know, if you're someone who's already on some of these meds, you may not have even have heard of all of these. So let me just walk through them so you can kind of keep in the back of your mind, oh, these are things that I might want to consider. Um, maybe you have a family history of some of these things that would put you at a, a different risk profile. Um, that would, And um, these are things that are, these are not things that like, if this happens, you know, you can't have hormones. It's more like we have to adapt and your prescriber has to make some adjustments. Um, or maybe you have to see another specialist or we'll work together with another specialist. So for example, people who are feminizing the highest risk is blood clots. So when I see a new patient, I ask them, has anybody in your family had a, had a blood clot? Have they had a heart attack, a stroke, or a blood clot in their arms or their legs, right? I want to know if there's any uh, already predetermined family risk there. Um, there is an increased risk of high blood pressure or and weight gain. Uh, if there's migraine headaches, giving someone estrogen can exacerbate them. In that case, I work with someone's you know, neurologist to make sure they have the right um, headache, um, preventive headache medication. It increases the risk of heart disease. Um, 
Cholelithiasis is a fancy word for gallstones, right? So your gallbladder can can make make stones. Um, it shouldn't, but sometimes it does. And the risk of cholelithiasis is a little bit lower for folks who are AMAB than for folks who are um, AFAB, right? So assigned male versus assigned female. So if you're going on estrogen, your risk of, of gallbladder disease goes from that of someone assigned male at birth slightly up to someone who to that of someone who's assigned female at birth. Um, uh, the liver, the estrogen gets processed through the liver, so the liver um, can work a little harder, and that can result in some changes in your blood work. Um, remember saying earlier that if someone goes on estrogen, the, um, uh, how do I say this? So before I was mentioning about, about pubertal suppression, that the brain kind of communicates with the ovaries and the testes. Um, well, sometimes in the, in the pituitary, there can be a little mass. It's called a prolactinoma. And um, prolactin is what tells someone's breasts to lactate. So when, when a body gets exposed to estrogen, the brain says, ah, she's pregnant. And it starts to produce more prolactin to try to get the, the, the breast to lactate. Um, so sometimes we give somebody estrogen to cause to, because we're looking for feminizing and for development and for breast development, but instead it results in sort of this excess production of, um, uh, prolactin. Sometimes that comes just because we're giving the estrogen. Sometimes it comes from there actually being a tiny little special kind of tumor up there in the pituitary. The estrogen is sort of aggravating. Again, these are kind of rare things, but uh, there might be someone in the room who says, oh my gosh, that's going on in my family. I should really be careful of that. Um, there seems to be an increased risk of breast cancer and that but we now know from some really great data that the risk is um, higher than someone who's assigned male at birth who doesn't go on estrogen, but not as high as a cis female. So it kind of goes up a little bit, but not that much. Um, and the last thing is obviously it affects fertility. When someone goes on masculinizing, that's the most common thing that we see. And this can happen at a very low dose of T. So for some folks, I have, we have to be really careful with this, is that it can result in, um, so testosterone triggers the um, production of red blood cells. It, it stimulates the production of red blood cells. And your body is supposed to have a, you know, just a, whatever the normal amount is that's circulating. And if the normal amount of red blood cells are circulating, then the blood can easily flow through the blood vessels. But when you have too much, too many cells in there, it gets sludgy. And then what happens? You're at risk for having a blood clot, right? So there's some numbers we look at for this. This is the, uh, if, you know, if I have to check someone's labs, if I only get to check one blood test once a year of somebody who's on T, then this is the thing I want to check. I want to check their blood count, even more than in the liver, even more than their T level. Because if they're masculinizing and they're physically changing and, the, and their blood count looks good, then I'm, I'm good. Sometimes we see severe um, liver tests, uh, severe liver abnormalities. Um, this is less uh, common um, uh, than the blood cell issue that I just mentioned, um, but it is, still, it is still common, so I'm going to mention it. Um, we can see weight gain, we can see an increase in um, the risk for cardiovascular disease, which means like your cholesterol uh, levels will, will shift, will go upward. That's why I tell all my trans mask folks, um, patients, I'm like, you've got to do something every day for 20 minutes where you're out of breath. You've got to do some kind of exercise to help um, drive up the good cholesterol to sort of combat that a little bit. Now, the risk of um, breast and uterine cancer changes, right? We know now that the risk of breast cancer in someone who's transmasculine is lower than that of a cis female, but higher than that of someone who's, who's AMAP. Um, again, migraine headaches can be uh, exacerbated um, by hormones, by uh, testosterone, and there's a higher risk of high cholesterol, diabetes, um, and again, fertility is an issue. You know, the, the mood swings probably should come off of that list. Um, we have new data on that now. All right, I have got only a few slides left, and be able to open up for questions. I hope there's some questions coming up. I hope that you have, you're answer, entering them in the chat or in the Q&A. Really excited to, to really talk about what's more of interest to you. Um, I've got, and we're very close to getting through the last few slides I have. Okay, so what do people want to see typically from hormones? Well, when someone's feminizing, um, they want to see breast development. And if you look at the, the months in the sort of right next to sort of the, the, the different physical changes, the physical attributes, those are the months when will start to see changes. Now, mileage varies. It's a little bit different for, for everyone. Um, but typically, breast development starts to happen three to six months after starting hormones. Unfortunately, for folks who are masculinizing, 
body hair and facial hair typically doesn't start until six to 12 months. Um, sometimes there's folks who are AFAB who have a higher testosterone level to begin with, and they may see that sooner. But for someone who doesn't have that sort of higher level of T to begin with, it's usually a six to 12 month thing. Um, let's see. Uh, well, I'll just let you take a look at this and, and see. Um, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, I have a question for you. I'd like to know what you think of when you hear the word transgender. Where are we at? This is my last slide, by the way. This should create another word cloud. I may have, I may have broken the internet, but we'll see. Ah, okay, it's not coming. I'm gonna stop my share for a second. I'm gonna see if I can get this in front of us. Keep keep sending it, keep sending your, we've got eight, eight results in. I'm gonna see if I can pull this up for us a different way. There we go. you guys can see that as well. And I just want to leave this up for a moment. Um, let you guys see where you're at. And then um, Maya, I'm looking to you for any kind of questions that may have come up. So far, no questions in chat or the Q&A. OK. Is there any I, questions? Yeah. I see love and diversity and liberation and brave and magic and friends yeah. and Elliot Page <laughs> and gender. Yeah. People like me. I love that one. Yeah, you being self-made. Yeah. There's another iconic, um, if you're into literature, um, there's a book, A Self-Made Man, Jameson Green, that's uh, you might be interested in. Diane? Yes, hi. We have, a, we have a question in the room. Uh, I love it. Uh, yeah. Can can you repeat that for me, Wolfgang? Because it's they're too far from the mic for me to hear. Yeah, um, they're coming up actually. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I guess just living in Wyoming, you know, there are different like laws, like state laws that prevent getting the trans health people need, and like how much variation there are between states, like some place from New York versus Wyoming. So yeah, so there are no restrictions in Wyoming. And I think that's the most important statement that I can share with you. Yes, there are some places that have lost their minds and are um, have the pendulum has sort of shifted in a very um, dangerous way. Um, but let me just say, here's what's really interesting. Like, I, I do wanna give you some hope in that regard. In the last year, year and a half, I've given talks on trans health and pubertal suppression and how to do hormones with prescribers in Arkansas, in Indiana, in Alabama. I mean, in places where these restrictions exist, where providers are like, this is just ridiculous. I, we want to know how to do it. So when it gets lifted, clearly it's needed. Um, so I feel like the, I just, I want to just share that the perspectives of the politicians do not accurately respect, uh, reflect the perspectives and the and the awareness and the and the position of the science-based evidence-based medical and nursing professionals but for now but for the moment everything looks good smooth sailing in wyoming thanks for asking i'm not a, i'm not a lawyer but that's that's what i have for you does anybody else have a question yeah go uh, <laughs> Hi, I was just kind of wondering, um, does donating blood help mitigate um, the erythrocytosis um, in trans menu development when they start teeth? 
Yeah, so there's a couple of ways that um, if, if one of my patients has that elevated red blood cell count, then there's a couple things I can do. And it depends on how high it is, right? So can you donate blood? Yes, that will bring it down. But here's the thing. Do you really want to continue to donate blood regularly? Um, or do you want to adjust the T to a place where it's not overstimulating your your um, the cells that are responsible for making the red blood cells, right? So you're so T is a um, it's a steroid, right? It's a it has androgenic effects, has anabolic effects, and when that starts to happen, it it's a cue to us that hey, something is just a little um, a little too much. Can maybe you make it just uh, maybe some providers might make a decision with their patients. Okay we're going to stay at this dose, we're going to give you six months on this dose, we're going to give blood, we're going to monitor it that way, and then we're going to go down to a, a, a dose, a slightly different adjusted dose that doesn't result in this side effect, right? Um, the, the other thing is, I, I think the, the thing that people don't talk about much is the amount of tea it takes to masculinize is exponentially smaller, lower than the circulating T in someone who's um, who's cis, right? So it may it may take it may be fine to have that number under eight hundred. It may be you know a level of twelve hundred that results in those red blood cells. Do you really need the red bloods the, the twelve hundred level in order to masculinize? You really you really don't, right? So uh, so yes, you. Giving blood is definitely an option, and there are some cases I've, I've had maybe two patients over the years for whom, like, I had to do that because just they weren't masculinizing, um, I, in order to be able to give them that boost. But that's really, really rare. Typically, if that's happening, uh, the the way that most folks will recommend is to make a subtle dose adjustment and just recheck the labs. And mileage varies, right? Like, if this is happening to you or someone you know. Um, like this is something to talk, talk about with your provider for sure. But yeah, yeah, yes, it's definitely an option. Thank you for asking that. That was that was a really nuanced, really good one. Thank you. I have a question from the chat. They're wondering if uh, we can get a copy of these slides if possible. Sure, you got it. My pleasure. And I will tell you, we are recording this session. Um, I believe that Wolfgang and Ray will be making this available to anyone who needs it at some point. And yeah. I think that's all the questions we have, Diane. That's the wonderful. Uh, this was absolutely fun. I'm so glad to have had a chance to do it. I have no idea if I hit the mark as far as what your expectations were or if you had other things that you're curious about. Um, like I said, you guys can always reach out to me through uh, social media. If there's anything else that comes up, just remind me that you're a part of this group and I'll be happy to answer it. Thank you, Maya and Wolfgang and Ray. This was a blast. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a good night, Diane. Bye. Bye.